said, amen, amen. See, I believe today something's going to happen. I believe today that there is going to be an impartation of the word in your life. It's going to be implanted from the young to the not so young. Notice I'm keeping my eyes straight forward and not looking at anybody. <laughs> the seasoned, <laughs> the more experienced at life. I believe God's got something for you. And the series that we're in, the Power of series, I truly believe that God's got something for us as a body, something that he's wanting to shake us loose from, to move us forward in. And we're in our, in our text <laughs> that I'm going to be in. Now, I asked you guys the first week of this, and I got some varying responses for those that were here the first part of the summer. And, and I said, how long should I do this series? I don't know, because I've got like a 100-part series on this right now. Uh, should I go three weeks? And you're like, nah. Four weeks? Some of you said, yeah, yeah. Some of you went six. Some, someone said eight. <laughs> Tom, <laughs> yeah. that was the week you were in Mexico fishing and not catching anything. <laughs> I just threw out, I just aired your laundry right then publicly. <laughs> oh, but I truly believe God's got something for us. And so this, our main text, turn with me to the Old Testament. Turn with me to 2 Kings. 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 13 is an interesting chapter, is an interesting chapter, because in it we're seeing the end of the life of one of the greatest prophets in the history of Israel. The prophet Elisha was an interesting character, and if you've ever done a study on the life of Elisha, in fact, there's a great book that Stephen Furtick wrote that's basically about the life of Elisha. And he has a cool title of it. If you want to know it, it you can go look on his, on his website or uh, Elevation Church website and, and then buy his book there. But in it, Elisha has a very interesting life. And, and we see the end of it here in chapter 13. And, and he had a full life. I mean, he started out as a farmer. He started out as an average Joe. The man who works hard to provide for his family. The man who had to wake up before the sun and would go to bed only when his farming was done. He was a man of faithfulness, consistency, and hard work before he was ever even a prophet. And last week, in the 15th point that I had, that we never got to, <laughs> that would have been it. <laughs> And he was interesting, and so let's start now in 2 Kings chapter 13, and start in verse 14. Now Elisha had been suffering from the illness from which he died. And Jehoash, king of Israel, went down to see him, and he wept over him. My father, my father, he cried, the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. And Elisha said, Get a bow and some arrows. And he did so. And take the bow in your hands, he said to the king of Israel. And when he had taken it, Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. Verse 17 is our main text, and I want us to stay in it for a little bit. Open the east window, he said, and he opened it. Shoot, Elisha, Elisha said, and he shot. And this is what Elisha said. The Lord's arrow of victory. The arrow of victory over Aram, Elisha declared. You will completely destroy the Arameans at Aphek. So let's stop there. We know just from history that the Israelites went on and defeated the Arameans at Aphek, but they did not completely destroy them. But Elisha just said they would completely destroy them. Huh? But I thought 
God said that it would happen. See, how is it possible that God would announce the potential for freedom and yet his children still live in bondage? It's a great question. It's a hard question, and I love hard questions, if you know me. I love hard questions that we need to ask of God. Because you know what? God loves hard questions because he has the answers. Amen? How is it possible that God could announce the potential peace of his people by sending the Prince of Peace, but yet his people still continue to live in inner turmoil? How is it God declares something, but yet people don't live in what he declared? How is it possible? How is it possible that Jesus would pray, Father, I pray that they would be united, that they would be one just as you and I are one, but yet we live in a divided nation. How is it possible? See, today, I want to talk to you about the power of potential. The power of potential. The power of potential. Look at verse 18. And then Elisha said, take the arrows. And the king took them. Elisha told him, strike the ground. And the king struck it three times and stopped. How many times? Three times. And the man of God was angry with him. <laughs> I love that. And said, you should have struck the ground five or six times, O king. And then you would have defeated Aram and completely destroyed it. But now you will only defeat it three times. There was a contingency. And we're going to find out what the contingency is when God says something. The contingency is always going to be you and me. See, it didn't happen just because God said it. We saw that in this verse. It doesn't just happen because we believe it. Can I say it that way? What? But we're people of faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. I said to this mountain, be removed and it will be cast into the sea. And I did not doubt in my heart. And I will have the things I say. We're people of faith. The Bible's full of faith. Just because you believe something doesn't mean that it happens. I'm going to prove it to you. <laughs> I'm going to prove it to you. He told him to strike the ground three times and then stopped. I want you to notice what Elisha said. Take the arrows... And strike the ground. Did Elisha tell him how many times? No. No. So the king, and in my mind, I'm going to get to this in a, in, a, in, a, in a ways. I believe that the king grabbed three arrows. Notice in the first when he said, take an arrow and shoot it over Aram. The arrow of victory over the Arameans. And he shot one arrow, but yet then Elisha said, take the arrows, plural. I believe that the king probably grabbed three arrows. And he grabbed three arrows and he struck the ground three times. It's just how people generally are. He struck the ground three times. Last week we saw, well, why do you think he only struck the ground three times? He was probably confused about the instructions. Sometimes... We don't understand the why behind what we're doing. And because we don't understand the why, we don't fully commit to what we're doing. But yet God sometimes will, ta will say, throw down your rod. Throw down your stick that's in your hand and watch the power of God. And Elisha's staff or Aaron's staff became a serpent and ate other serpents. Sometimes the instructions of God go to a country that you've never seen how do I get there? I'll show you every step of the way. You're not going to give me a map? No. Take your son, your only son, and go kill him. Wait, what? 
sometimes the instructions that God gives, go talk to those, swear, those, those, those guys in that boat who are swearing like sailors because they are sailors, and go tell them that they're going to be the foundation, the starters of the Christian church. What? Go tell a depressed teenager over there that's dealing with mental health issues. Go tell him he's scared, that, that, that little kid who's huddling in the corner, scared out of his mind for, of shadows and the voices that are going on all around him terrified out of his mind, and go tell him he's going to go pastor a church in Scottsdale, Arizona. What? Sometimes what God says to us in the moment doesn't make sense. Lucy, I said I'm going to stay on track. I'm going to stay on track. (laughs) And here's the thing. I grab the arrows, and he strikes it three times. If you would have... You, if you, sh- you should have, then you would have. See, that's what Elisha said. He said, you should have struck the ground five or six times, not three times. If you would have, if you, or you should have, then because you, you would have it. But because you didn't, you don't. And we see something. See, it's the power of potential. See, that place would stick in my mind, and it's a horrible place to live. Regret, right? Oh, I should have. If I, if I would have, then I would have that. But I didn't, so I don't. Right? That place of regret in our minds, and I can guarantee you the king, after Elisha grew angry and told him what would have happened, he probably lived in a horrible place. And it's a bad place to live in. It's a place where we keep living in what we could have done but did not do. Regret. Unmet potential. See, when it comes to potential, we all need to be careful. (laughs) I have four points today, and I'm going to try to get to them all. All of them today. I have almost double the amount of notes that I normally do. Last week, I talked about the power of preparation. (laughs) There you go. There's a lot of prep that went into this series. (laughs) See, my first point, and I'm going to throw it on the screen, is the power of potential. Or, uh, excuse me, potential. (laughs) That's the title. Potential is unpredictable. Potential is unpredictable. Predictable. What do I mean by that? See, even the prophet who saw what could have been the Lord's arrow, complete destruction over the Arameans, didn't see what was to come next right after. Because he told the king, grab the arrows and strike the ground. But yet he didn't predict the outcome fully. He said there would be victory over the Arameans, but he didn't know how. See, here's a dating tip to those who are dating or going to date. Mark, I'm talking to you. Come on, Nika. Come on, all of you. Oh, well, the single ladies. Yes, I just did the Beyonce dance. Come on. Uh, How does a pastor know that? I don't know. So my 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 daughter showed me. Okay, she didn't. I lied. She. I don't even think she was alive when that song came out. All the single ladies. All the single. Anyway, here's a dating tip. Don't pick a mate based on their potential. Man, oh, oh, right? <laughs> you immediately, all, their, all those who have done that, are immediately pointing at the sign going, oh, no, oh, yeah, that's unpredictable. Because we all look at someone, man, they dress for success. I mean, look at Steve, he's sharp. Mm. <sighs> right? We all look at someone and say, man, that's a, that's a lovely specimen for humanity right there, right? I mean, we all do it. And we see them, and they're like, man, they're successful in what they do. And, oh, man, they're, they're marriage material. 
I could get like what's what's the old uh, uh, what's the the lady who used to ma- the matchmaker 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 make me a match come on you know that I grew up on the old movies Fiddler on the Roof and and, so, and what do they do they come and grab the girl's hips in the all the old minis she's got great childbearing hips <laughs> right <laughs> potential and we don't ever and we then we go and make decisions based on their potential right. See, but here's my thing to you all. You're not Joanna Gaines. What? Who's ever seen Joanna Gaines show The Fixer Upper? Right? We've gone to, uh, where's that? What's the town? Waco, thank you. We, <laughs> I know, how can you forget Waco? Thank God for the Gaines family because they totally took the stigma of, of Waco <clears throat> and, and totally turned it around. And they got a great, the silos there. If you've ever drive through Waco, there's Baylor University, gorgeous Baptist campus. Holy cow, I haven't seen many university campuses that are as beautiful as Baylor. And then you go to the silos. It's the only two things. <laughs> the rest is what you imagine. But you're not Joanna Gaines. You can't go and fix something up. You can't. Don't think you can fix them up because you think he has potential. But yeah, but his, his, his he's got a temper. But it's okay. Oh, he has potential, though, but yet he treats his mama with such disrespect. What do you think? In 35 years, he's going to suddenly be so nice to you? No, he's going to treat you like he's treated his mama his whole life. Don't look for potential. Don't look for potential. Look for patterns. You need to write that down. Don't look for potential. Look for patterns. Don't pick according to potential Pick according to patterns. You watch patterns in people more than their potential. You don't try to find the perfect person, though. Watch for patterns. Man, he, he's frugal. He doesn't go just spend all his money on, on Slim Jims. He, <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't go open 16 credit cards and, and pay off a credit card with another credit card. Right? He... His pattern is respect and love. You look for patterns in people's lives, a consistent way of behavior. You want to make a choice, make it based on patterns. See, there was a band in 1962 who went in for an audition. 1962, Tom. I bet you can already figure out what band it is. In 1962, a band, mostly guitars and one drummer, all guitars and one drummer, went in for an audition And you know what the studio manager said to them? You do not have potential in the music industry because guitar bands are going out. 1962. But you know what's funny? That band went on to sell, uh, you know, just one or two albums. I mean, you probably don't even know their name. They were called the Beatles. But, um, and and (laughs) they had no potential. No potential. They had no potential, but you know what? Their pattern, their patterns of trying and not giving up, their patterns of practicing constantly, their patterns of writing new music all the time, push them through, and who are they now, right? The Beatles. You, nobody knows them, though. I mean, come on. Who's ever bought a Beatles album? Only two people in here. That's fine. <laughs> I want to hold your hand. I want to hold your... Come on now. <laughs> See, look at your neighbor and tell them, <laughs> you don't know my potential. Look at them. Spouses, look at each other. Boyfriends, look at your girlfriend and say, you don't know my... Neighbors, sisters, brothers, look at your, your, your neighbor and say, you don't know my potential. That, that studio manager didn't know the Beatles' potential. You don't know my potential. You don't know my potential, but here's the kicker, neither do you. You don't even know your own potential. We, because of our own self-doubt. See, imagine if the Beatles had allowed what that studio manager had said about them to create an image of self-reflection about themselves that they would start to believe and rehearse mentally. They wouldn't ever have become who they are today. And because of our self-doubt, though, we learn to only strike the ground three times and then give up, 
rather than five or six times. Because we don't even see our own potential. Why? Because we have a fear of falling short. Right? It's really what it boils down to. I went through a long list of thinking, why wouldn't we strike more than three times? Fear. It boils down to fear. I'm going to look stupid hitting the ground with an arrow. The arrow's made to fly, but I'm striking the ground. I just look stupid. Fear of what other people think. Maybe it's a fear of failure because you've tried before and failed. Maybe you've tried before and other people thought it was stupid or not successful. And because of it, you quit and you don't try again. Who remembers the story of the, of, of the, of the landowner who gave three of his, his uh, land managers talents? In other words, a year's wage. One he gave five, the other one he gave two, the other one he gave one. Remember what the last one did? It says because of fear of his, of the landowner, he didn't even invest that one dollar in the bank to get at least a four, or what is the return right now? It's not four percent. I'd love to say savings accounts for four, but what is it? Half a point. <laughs> Don't say that right now, Steve. No. I have a savings account. <laughs> That's in my emergency fund. But anyway, the, uh, <laughs> any, I'm not telling you to pull out and, and put into, the, you know, the, the S&P 5. I'm not telling except for right now, it's actually great. It's super low. But anyway, I'm not giving <laughs> financial advice, Steve. I'm not. I refuse to. <laughs> Forgive me. So, but he wouldn't even have put it in the bank for a half a point of return. Why? Because of fear. Fear kept him back. I used to preach about people who never try was because they didn't care enough. But then I started trying and failing. And then I realized it's not that we, they don't, we don't care enough. It's because I care so much that I don't try harder. I care so much what other people think. I care so much about results. I care so much that it limits my potential. Maybe the reason why the king only struck the ground three times wasn't because he was lazy, like I said last week. Maybe it was because he was fearful. Fear can be a bigger motive. In fact, I, I read so, uh, an author said that fear is the greatest motivator in the world. I think it was because he was scared because Aram, the nation, the, the group of nations that had been attacking Israel for so long was so big and so scary. See, remember, potential is unpredictable. I've decided, though, even though potential is unpredictable, there's the potential, but my actions depend, uh, depict if I reach my potential. I've decided that the pain of falling short is nothing compared to the shame of stopping short. You hear that? The pain of falling short is nothing compared to the shame of stopping short. So me as your pastor encourage you, don't stop short because of shame. The pain is fleeting. Shame is long term. Pain just because... Look at your neighbor again. Say it. Tell him this. At least I'm trying this is what I want you to do. At least you're trying. Look at somebody, anybody. I don't care. Say, at least I'm trying. I want you to t say it out loud. Why? At least I'm trying. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. But I failed, Pastor. I failed. I'd rather leave it all out there and find that I wasn't enough rather than wonder, what if? What if? What happens if I would have tried? My grandfather told me this. He said, what if is of the devil? We were driving in a car down 680 in California. We had just got done talking about a, a family friend of ours. And we talked about, and I said, what, ha what if I would have done that same thing? And he said, what if is of the devil? We were talking about a mistake. What if? 
don't play the what if game. Pain of not succeeding or falling short is better than the shame of stopping short. What if? What if? There's no shame in trying. At least you tried. I'm proud of you. If you tried, today I got out of bed. I tried to do my hair. I'm proud of you. <laughs> I tried to do my makeup today. I'm proud of you, Tom. <laughs> I tried to go to bed on time. I'm proud of you. I tried. I tried. I'm proud that you've at least tried rather than didn't even try. Failure, like I said, hurts for a moment, but regret lives with you longer. The good news, though, is that when you try and not succeed, when you try and fall short, the good news is that the window that Elisha told the king to open is still open. The window is still open. Somebody needs to say that to themselves. The window is still open. The window is still open. You're still alive. Your kid's still alive. You still have a bank account. You still have some energy in your body. There's, the window is still open. The window is still open. Thank God for this grace. Even if you didn't strike the ground like the king as many times as you should have, the window is still open. Which leads me to my second point. And I'm going to go in two minutes and get done with this. Right, Michael? Right, Lucy? Two minutes. Two more points. Potential is limited. Who has ever worked in a company, and maybe you're the business owner, Steve, <laughs> I'm not looking at you, and you put in your break room those inspirational posters? Have you ever done that? You, of course, right? Every company that I've ever worked for in the break room has an inspirational, like, eagle flying through the mountains, right, with a trophy in its hand, <laughs> right, and, like, holding a snake in the other and like a rifle over its shoulder, right? And one of those inspirational posters, right? A man surfing a 72-foot wave that's been photoshopped. And it's got an inspirational quote. And maybe you've seen this one where it says, <laughs> it says something like, you have unlimited potential. If you try, you will succeed. If you work as a team, you will, right? There's all of these out there. And they're great quotes. I mean, Tony Robbins coined almost all of them. <laughs> and Steve, the other half. But I want you to know, the one that Steve did not create <laughs> lied to you. That poster with the eagle flying through the mountains that says, your potential is unlimited. Your mama lied to you. When she said, you can do anything. You have unlimited potential. No, mamas didn't lie to you, sorry. Posters lied to you, sorry. <laughs> I, I just got the okay from my wife. It lied to you. Why? Because potential is limited. Let me prove it to you. We all remember the moments in our lives when we tried and failed. I remember growing up and my... I almost said my mama. That poster on the wall said I could do anything and be anything I wanted. I had unlimited potential. And I had a basketball court in my front yard. My dad had built it because he was an MVP Hall of Fame basketball player in his college. And so he built a basketball court so he could teach his kids, his sons, to be all-star NBA basketball players. And my brother, my brother just had moves that I just did not understand. For such a strong man, he looked like a snake sometimes moving through the, you know, through the court and getting, you know, laying in on people and, you know, 360s underneath their armpits and throwing the basketball in the hoop. And then I get out there, my mama knew that I wasn't anywhere near as good as my brother, anywhere near as good as my dad, anywhere near as consistent or as hardworking as either of them. 
And she told me, you can do it, Jaja. You have unlimited potential. I grew up thinking that I was the next Michael Jordan in my generation. Yeah, that's right. And then I went and tried out for the basketball team in middle school. And they threw a ball. We were doing, you know, full court press layups as fast as you can. Dribble all the way down the end and lay it in. It's junior high. It's seventh grade, right? It's about as hard as it gets. And, I'm, I, and, and when you get and you throw it in, you grab your own ball, and you throw it down court to the next guy. And, and they got down there, and, and Coach Dickinson's like, all right, you ready? And I get on the line, and I look at him. I'm like, yeah, I'm ready for the ball. And here it comes. Woo! Psh, right in my face. Right on the ground, and the tears, not the blood, the tears are splattered all over, the, all over the court. And I got up, and I cried all the way down. <laughs> and I went and laid it up and missed. <laughs> and I realized something. About three years later, as now I'm in high school, and I'm playing basketball, and I'm five foot eight, <laughs> and I'm going in, and now I've learned a couple more things, and I'm going in for a layup, and my six-foot-five friend, Isaac Graham, if he's watching, love you, is at Foothill Church right now, and they're probably having service right now too, and, and he's leading worship, and Isaac Graham, six-foot-20, 820 pounds of pure muscle, and he had facial hair and chest hair. <laughs> right? He did. And he played the bass, Tom, and led worship at the same time at, at, at his local youth group. This dude was pure, just manliness, right? And I'm going in for a layup, and he just stands there. Boosh! And not only does he slap the ball down my face, he slaps my dreams down. And I realize something, that I didn't need to be the next Michael Jordan. And had that poster in the break room, in the local gym, lied to me. I didn't have unlimited potential. I found out a hard truth. <laughs> it's quite funny because people say that talk is cheap. And I'm, no, I'm not a basketball player. I went and played a half season of, of college basketball before the league got shut down because it was like Division 50. <laughs> and, and, and my coach was from UCLA. It was great. I was actually played a half a season. And, you know, anyway. And, uh, and I realized that I didn't want to be a basketball player. I wanted to fulfill the God's call in my life. But the thing is, talk is cheap, right? But that's what I do for a living. So what does that say about me? <laughs> I find that potential. See, I have potential. But don't you get tired of hearing it? Right? Don't you get tired of hearing, you have potential. Oh, I see potential in you. Every single time. I remember preaching and, and, a, and an older gentleman in the church who was a seasoned veteran minister. He came and told me after I got done preaching, you have potential, son. You have potential. And at first I'm like, thanks. And then I realized as I looked at his face, he wasn't saying it as a compliment. Yeah, but you said crap like 15 times, and, and, and you said, you said freaking, uh, you know, or something that you're not allowed to, and I just said them right now. Hey, this is my church. I'm going to do whatever I want. <laughs> and, and, and he's looking at me. He's like, and your average age of the people in the seats right now is 67 years old, and you said crap three times, right? <laughs> yeah, he was saying, you have potential, but you're not there yet. You know, we're near there yet, right? <laughs> Do you know that potential means something hasn't matured into purpose yet? I remember those days very vividly, and they stuck with me. And they helped me, actually. See, potential. Potential. It's frustrating when people tell you, because it doesn't sound like a compliment when they tell you, because 90% of the time you have potential isn't a compliment, right? Potential. Potential. 
And why is it a compliment? Because even in your own mind, you realize it's not a compliment because they're saying you have potential, but you know that you haven't tried as hard as you can. You only struck the ground three times, and you know it yourself. And in your mind, that internal dialogue is already on repeat. I only struck three times. They say I have potential, but I'm not living up to it. I'm not living up to it. I'm not living up to it. Maybe you've been tormenting yourself over your potential, the potential that you haven't reached because you're judging yourself against a purpose that isn't yours. I wanted to be Stephen Furtick. I wanted to be Chris Hodges. I wanted to be Chad Veach or Judas Smith. I wanted to be, I wanted to be and their purpose is different than my purpose. This microphone is a nice microphone. Nice enough that Tom doesn't let me drop the mic. He cringes. See, he already just did it. Immediate cringe. <laughs> it's a Sennheiser. Sennheiser makes quality equipment, right? They do. I appreciate this mic. It was created to project my voice so I don't have to... Thank God for microphones. It has a purpose. It has a purpose. But this micro microphone can't build a house. Sometimes I want to just throw this mic out because it can't build a house. It's ludicrous to discard this microphone because it can't fill a purpose for which it wasn't created would be to, uh, to miss its potential. Missing its potential. And we judge ourselves because I can't go build a house. I lost my man card in Texas. And Pastor Rob Bellamy, he, he still has it. I was on the building team. And he realized how quickly... And how uh, uh, um, he realized very quickly that I should not have any tools at my disposal. He learned that. The only thing I was really good at is a forklift. I'm really good on a forklift. Oh, you want me to load a truck with a forklift? I get it done 90% faster than anybody you've ever known. I'm good on it. And there's some pride there. I'll, I'll repent later. But, <laughs> see, I'm not going to throw this microphone out because I can't build a house. I'm not going to miss my potential because I'm trying to fulfill Judas Smith's poten uh, p a purpose. I refuse to allow my inner dialogue to keep me from trying. I refuse. I was born to do what I was born to do. And when I do what God has made me to do, like God made me to do it, it's purpose. 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 Somebody say purpose. Purpose. Potential is designed and custom fit for your purpose. 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 Last po Third point. Yes, Michael. Third point. Potential has potential. If you're writing it down, it's up there. Potential has potential. See, this microphone has a purpose, but yet I can use this microphone to bring people together or tear them apart. Potential has potential. A man who was a strong man who was created to protect the weak has the potential to abuse his wife and kids. The smart man who has the potential to create innovative technology to save lives also has the potential to become a, a money-hungry madman. Or become Elon Musk. And, and everybody's conflicted about him, and I absolutely adore him. <laughs> it, it potential has potential. Potential has potential. Potential is like milk. Milk. Milk is great when you drink it. 
or throw it out before the little numbers on the side pass, right? Milk has the ability to be provision to your bones, right? But it also has the potential to be poisonous. Who would ever drink that milk that's been sitting on that shelf for six weeks? Anyone? Anyone? Mela, you probably already have. <laughs> it's my fault for not throwing it out. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> the milk that was in the fridge when my family got back because I didn't touch it in three weeks, don't drink that. <laughs> right? Potential. Potential. Potential has potential. This is why some of us are miserable. Because the potential that's on the shelf is unused and the time for it has passed. We've allowed it to go so long without being used that now that potential is becoming poisonous to our soul because we're not fulfilling our potential. Because we're not trying. Because we're too scared. We've never tried it before. I've never had milk. I don't want to try that milk. It looks weird. It's white. Why is it white? Nothing in nature is white. That's weird. That can't be natural. It comes out of an animal. I'm not drinking that, right? It's potential. And fear keeps us from fulfilling God's purpose on our lives. And because of it, we become miserable because we're not living in our potential. I'm so thankful, and this is how I'm going to close because I'm not going to get to point four, Lucy. You were right. I'm thankful that I tried to be a basketball star and failed. You know why? Because my basketball coach said this to me and opened my eyes to something. He said, Josh, no, he called me Pink. No, Pinky, that was my nickname. Pinky, you're a great basketball player, but you're more interested in talking to people about Jesus than you are about basketball, and because of it, you'll never be a great basketball player. He said it as an insult, and he didn't realize. And Scott Babinette changed my life because he said potential, potential. Microphones can't build houses. And a few years ago, I went back and I looked at how many houses were being built in my department at Tree of Life Church in Texas with Habitat for Humanity. And I saw how many people were living in the homes that we had built for them. And I realized something. This microphone can build a house. And I realized something. That just because I tried and failed didn't mean that I didn't live up to the potential that God had for me. I'm thankful for that old seasoned veteran minister that said you have potential. I'm so thankful for him saying that. I'm thankful for, for Isaac, uh, Isaac Graham who swatted that basketball down my throat and dashed my dreams of being Michael Jordan. I'm thankful for them. Kids, don't quit because you're not good at something. Adults, husbands, don't quit because you're bad at marriage. Employees, don't quit because you don't know how to load a truck like Pastor Josh. You never will. You'll never beat me. I beat 27 employees in a, in a, in a timed marathon that I put on with advantages and benefits, and we only put three holes in three trucks, so it was fine. So, <laughs> and all three were from me, so it was fine. <laughs> You'll never be as fast. But don't give up. Don't stop striking. It's the power of potential. How did a microphone build a house? How did a stick part a red sea? How did a mustard seed become the kingdom of God? How did a baby become the savior of the world? If I use what I've got, this is how. If I use what I've got, God will be what I'm not. Did you hear it? If I use what I've got, get the arrow. 
It's right here. It's accessible. Strike the ground. If I use what I have within my reach, the gifts that God has given me, the abilities that God has placed on the inside of you, if you use them, God will be what you are not. And though your uh, potential and your ability stop short, God will fill the rest. Don't give up. Turn to your neighbor and say, at least I'm trying. At least I'm trying. My last point, if you want to write it down, is actually the most important. And it's what I started with about Elisha. Process reveals potential. Elijah was walking across and he saw Elisha plowing his fields. He didn't see the potential in Elisha, he didn't say, hey, his name is just one letter off for mine, or two letters off for mine. It's like the next progression sounds just like it. No, he saw the process. He saw the hard work. Jesus didn't choose Peter because he was an eloquent speaker. No, he was ignorant. He was an uneducated man, couldn't talk very well. But he saw how well Peter cast that net. And he said, Peter, I'll I'm going to make you a fisher of men just like you're fishing. I saw the process in your life, the hard work that you had. He didn't choose David because he was a great songwriter. No, he saw the process that he had of shepherding his flock. Potential is not always seen. It's the processes that are. Are you willing to? To go into the process that you might not even understand. God, really? You're going to make me lead a nation? I only know how to lead sheep. God, really? You're going to give me a microphone? I'm scared of my own shadow. I stutter. I, I, I don't know even what to talk about. And as a child, I would never have dreamed of standing anywhere in public. But the processes, the processes that we see is how you make decisions. The process determines the potential. God, I thank you. And here's the thing, God. I'd never want to meet my potential because the minute I meet my potential is the minute I look face to face on you. <laughs> I want to keep running after my potential. Lord, I want to keep running after my potential because it gives me, it gives me a reason to keep going, to keep striving, to get up in the morning and decide that today is the day that I'm going to make and reach the purpose of God in my life for today. Today I'm going to be a better man than I was yesterday. Today is the day that I'm going to treat my family better than I did last week. Today I'm going to get up and I'm going to see the mercies of God new every morning. Today is the day that I'm going to strive, as Paul said in Philippians 3, forward towards the goal of the upward call of God in my life. I'm going to keep pressing forward, not looking behind me. And God, when I do that, when I do that, when I do that, when I try, you make up the rest. The supernatural and the natural colliding make a, make a powerful force that cannot be stopped. And today, God, I pray that we would realize that our, pro, that our potential is made by the processes that we create in our lives. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody said, amen.